I want to welcome you to City of God this morning. Uh, my name's Eric. I'm one of the pastors here, if you're new with us. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9 today. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 23. So if you want to open there uh, to answer the big question uh, swirling around the room right now, we will have you out in time for tip-off. So uh, no stress there, but Hebrews 9, 23 uh, is where we're going to pick up. While you're turning there, I know we've all had this thought at some point in our lives. Then maybe you've been sitting in a class or maybe even a church service listening to uh, a teacher or a pastor or a professor kind of go on and on, and you've thought, when am I ever going to use this? Uh, This room is probably not the room to say this in, given the amount of math people we have in this city, but my math classes in junior and senior high were my, when am I ever going to use this classes? I was never very good at math from the time I was 16. I knew I wanted to go into ministry. And so really, uh, why would I need to know these things? And so I didn't pay much attention and didn't try very hard. I did enough to keep kind of moving on, mostly by staying after school and getting extra help. Uh, But it was difficult for me to care. And this, when am I ever going to use this, led to one of the almost great disasters of my life when in my senior year of high school, I was dating a girl who was in an AP statistics course, and she convinced me to take that class as the last math credit I needed to graduate high school. I had no business being in that class. I knew it. The school knew it. They let me take it anyway. And, well, it went about as well as you thought it would go with me being in that kind of class. And so every other class in senior high, I got A's and B's, which is why it was so surprising when my teacher, the math teacher, kept me after class one day, April of my senior year, and told me, if you do not get your grade in this class up to a D, you're not graduating high school, which was not a thought that had entered my head as a possibility I might be facing. And so thankfully, I snuck through the class with a D. Uh, I completed some extra work, the extra work being I stayed after a few times and cleaned her room for her, and magically my grade went up, and so here I am today. Uh, But the entire time I was going through that class and going through that material, I just kept thinking over and over, I'm never going to use this. I'm never going to need this. Once I'm out of here, I'm never turning on this TI-82 calculator again. And I was right. Because I went to a college that didn't require me to take any math classes, which might have you questioning uh, the uh, value of the college education I received, but it worked for me, and I'm doing fine. And there's schools out that like there if you need it. Now, for most of the people who call City of God home, most of the the college students we have here, their thought is not going to be, when am I ever going to need this sitting in their math classes? But there's something. There's some subject, some idea, some topic that just seems so abstract and so out of touch with everyday life, you just don't know why you need to know it. And I bring this up because if we can just be honest with each other for a second, maybe some of you are feeling that way as we're going through the book of Hebrews right now. That as we've spent the past few weeks discussing the Old Testament priesthood and animal sacrifices and the tabernacle and the covenants over and over and over, you've found yourself thinking, when am I going to use this? Why do I need to know these things? And if you're feeling that way, know I'm feeling a little bit of that as well. Because really, throughout Hebrews 5 through 10, the six-chapter window, the author does keep repeating himself. And so as you're reading or listening to Hebrews, maybe you're finding yourself thinking, we did it. Jesus is our priest. Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus instituted a better covenant. We get the point of this. And especially on Sunday mornings when people make the effort to get up and they come to church hoping to hear something that will help them get through the next few days or something they can use that will make a difference in their everyday life. And yet what do we discover at the end of Hebrews 9? It's more of the same. The next five verses, more of the same. 
It's more tabernacle. It's more animal sacrifices. It's more how Jesus is the fulfillment of both of those things. And before you turn out or your eyes glaze over or I assume that I've preached this before, I do think that in this text we discover why the author has been so unwilling to let this topic go. Why it feels like he's almost been like a dog chewing on a bone when he contemplates Jesus with these Old Testament rituals and regulations. We pick up in verse 23, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not only into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And in many ways, these two verses summarize what we've been talking about the last month. What has Jesus done for us as our great high priest, like the priest in the Old Testament who would enter the presence of God and make a sacrifice on behalf of the people? Jesus also entered the presence of God and made a better sacrifice on behalf of God's people. But rather than offering the sacrifices of bulls and goats like had been done before, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. Verse 25. Now it was to offer himself, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, what made Jesus' sacrifice so much greater than the sacrifices offered to God in the Old Testament? First, there's a difference in quality between these sacrifices. The the perfect, sinless life of Christ was a much greater sacrifice offered to God than any animal ever could be. But in these two verses, we also learn that Jesus made his sacrifice once and for all, not repeatedly, once and for all at the end of the age to put away sin. And we really stressed this point last week, so I won't spend a ton of time on it this morning. But by dying on the cross, by offering himself up, Jesus, we read, put away sin. What does that mean? Every human being who has ever lived has sinned against God. We've all disobeyed him, and because we've all disobeyed God, we're deserving of his judgment. And we see in this that if God God were just and fair, if God gave us what we deserved, then we would face punishment or condemnation from God at the end of this life because of our sin, but out of his love for us. Jesus came to do what we could never do for ourselves. He healed our broken relationship with God. By dying the death that we deserve to die on the cross, by dying in our place for our sins and receiving the judgment from God that we should have received at the end of this life, Jesus made it possible for sinful human beings to enter back into a relationship with a holy God. And if you and I are willing to put our hope and trust in Jesus... If we're willing to believe that Jesus' death on the cross was for our sin, then we discover we can be forgiven. We can be made right with God. And this forgiveness is not something we could earn on our own, not something we could deserve by doing enough good works. It's only possible because Jesus died in our place for our sins. And everyone who has been around for the past few weeks said, We know because we've heard this. We heard this in chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9. And sneak preview, you're going to hear it in chapter 10. So it's over and over. Now the question is, why does the author of Hebrews continue to go on and on, seemingly making one point repeatedly? Some of you might remember the quote I've used before from Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians to answer this question when he wrote, here I must take counsel of the gospel. I must give attention to the gospel, which teaches me not what I ought to do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. 
specifically that he suffered and died to deliver me from sin and death. The gospel compels me to receive this and to believe it, and this is the truth of the gospel. It's also the principal article of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consists. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know this article well, teach it unto others, and beat it into their heads continually." And it seems like he's just following the example of the author of Hebrews on this point. And there's a lot of truth in what Luther says here. If we don't regularly remind ourselves of the gospel, if we don't repeatedly return to the truth that a relationship with God is possible solely because of the grace that he has made available to us through Jesus' death and resurrection, we will forget it. We'll begin to believe that what makes us right with God is what we do. We'll find our confidence and our assurance in our relationship with God, in our church attendance, in our quiet times, in our spiritual activity, in our good deeds. We'll start to believe the lie that when we're doing the things we're supposed to do, we're good with God and He loves us. But when we have a few bad days, we're out of his love and we'll ride this spiritual roller coaster the rest of our lives, hoping that we die at a high point. That's not the gospel. That's not the kind of life that God intended us to experience. And if you've been around City of God for any length of time, you've heard this. You know this. This is the most precious truth at the core of who we are as a church. Jesus died for our sins to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. But again, the question comes, and it's okay to ask the question, but aren't there other things we need to know? Aren't there other things the original audience of Hebrews needed to hear? Because again, what do we know about these people that Hebrews was written to? More than likely, this was written to a church in Rome comprised of many Christians who had formerly been Jews, and they were beginning to experience persecution for their faith in Christ. Some of them had strained relationships with family members once they became Christians if their families had not cut them off entirely. Uh, Some of them were struggling to find work because it was expected in Rome in that day that depending on the job that you had, you would worship the God or the deity of that occupation. And when Christians refused to do that, often they were left looking for a new job. Many of them were being looked at by suspicion with those in authority. And we know that at least some of them were being tortured and imprisoned and exiled or even killed for their faith in Jesus. This is a church where people were scared, they were hurting, they were anxious, they needed help, and they were really struggling to remain faithful to Jesus. And you can imagine the day the letter of the Hebrews shows up to that church for the first time. Finally, this Christian leader had taken the time to encourage them. Here is the word we need to faithfully endure all the hardships that we're facing. And then they open Hebrews and they begin to read it. And what do they discover inside? Do you guys remember what it was like to worship God in the days of Moses during the Exodus You remember all the regulations surrounding the Day of Atonement and what the priest would do and what the high priest would do? Remember how the tabernacle was set up? That there was this first section that just any priest could go into and a second section that only the high priest could go into? You remember Melchizedek and ceremonial washings and uh, all these other things and the objects that were placed in the Ark of the Covenant? And maybe they reacted similarly to how some of us have experienced Hebrews. What are you talking about? Why are you spending so much time on this stuff? We're hurting. We're desperate. Some of us are in hiding, and we've given up everything to follow Jesus. What we need right now is not a diagram of the tabernacle. Give us something to help us now, here, today. Maybe you feel that way when you open your Bible sometimes. 
life gets difficult. And in many ways, the older we get, it only gets harder. There's any number of things that might be weighing on you as you sit here this morning. Maybe it's marriage. It could be a struggle you're having in your current marriage. It could be the pain of a past marriage. It could be the fact that you want to be married to someone and you haven't been able to find anybody yet. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's feeling unsatisfied at work. Maybe it's the feeling of being uncertain with what to do with the rest of your life. Maybe it's the kids, the pain of not being able to have kids or the pain caused by kids once they're in your life. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's bitterness or anger or a health issue or losing someone close to you. This life is difficult and it feels like the hurts just never stop coming. And again, it feels like the older I get, the deeper the pains get and the more frequent they come. A few months ago, I went to a funeral for the mom of one of my best friends growing up, and I realized the older I get, these hurts are going to start feeling a lot more personal and maybe be a lot more painful. Because what used to be funerals for great-grandparents and relatives that I didn't know very well are starting to get a little bit closer to me every day. Again, this life is hard, and once you get past one hurt, it feels like there's always two or three more waiting for you, and so you go to your Bible, you go to church looking for help. How can I get through this week? How can I find something to just help me keep moving forward? And you open up a book like Hebrews, and what do you find? Five or six chapters on the priesthood and the tabernacle and incense and animal sacrifices and some guy named Melchizedek and who knows what else. Or you just find the same thing over and over about Jesus being a greater sacrifice. And again, what are we supposed to do with this? How is this supposed to help us? I know it's good news, but how does it help me today to deal with the junk that I brought in here this morning. But the more I thought about it, the more I think there's a reason the author of Hebrews sent this letter to these Christians at this time, enduring all that they were enduring. Because as they wrestled with whether to remain faithful to Jesus and how to deal with all the problems they were facing, There's a reason the author of Hebrews thought this truth is what these people need right now. Go back with me to verse 26 for a second. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly, talking about Jesus, since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Again, I know there's seasons or long stretches of this life when it feels like you're just trying to keep your head above water. And in those moments, what are you desperately searching for? Something to hold on to. Something to keep you afloat. Some truth, some idea, one sure and true thing that is unchanging, that you never have to doubt, that you never have to be afraid that you will lose, that is not dependent on you keeping it all together. And in those desperate situations, both for the reader of Hebrews and for us, the author of this book steps in and says, I know what you need. I know what you need walking through that kind of life, and it's to know this. Jesus has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin. I don't know what the rest of your life or my life is going to look like. I know that difficult things are coming, and even in seasons when we don't suffer, trials will always come again. It's inevitable. They're just around the corner, seemingly. And where can we turn when the wind and waves of this life rage all around us? Charles Spurgeon said it best when he wrote, It is is often so with us. 
when the winds are out and the storms are raging, there is plenty of fear, but there is no danger. We may be such tossed, but we are quite safe, for we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which will not start. One blessed thing is that our hope has such a grip of us that we know it. In a vessel, you feel the pull of the anchor. The more the wind rages, the more you feel the anchor holds you. Like the boy with his kite, the kite is up in the clouds where he cannot see it, but he knows it is there for he feels its pull. So our good hope has gone up to heaven and he is pulling and drawing us toward himself. If Christ has dealt with sin once and for all, as the author of Hebrews writes, if this is true, Our greatest trouble in this life has already been dealt with. Our greatest question has already been answered. What will happen at the end of this life when I stand before God and give an account of the life that I've lived? Our greatest desire, whether we realize it or not, to know God and to be loved by Him is already within arm's reach. And even when you and your spouse are having the same fight for the hundredth time, or your child gets sick, or you lose your job, or you don't accomplish all you were supposed to in this life, or you feel so lonely you can barely stand it anymore, or you stop and just look around at all the suffering and injustice in the world as you tread water in those storms. Hebrews 9 tells us you can know not hope, not wish. You can know your sins are forgiven, that God has accepted you into his family, that he is with you, that he is for you, that he is preparing something better for you at the end of this life, that he's working all things together for your good, and that he will satisfy the desires of your heart. And you can know this because Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We may know this, we may tire of it at times, we may not know how much we need it, but the author of Hebrews knew that to this worn out and weary congregation and to the worn out and weary soul, the only thing worth talking about over and over again is who Jesus is and what he's done because it is the only unmoving and unshakable truth we can find in a dark world. Hebrews 5 through 10 is exactly what we need to help us meet the challenges of everyday life, but it's also what we need to meet the challenges of what is to come. Verse 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. The truth is we can become so distracted by the urgent needs of our lives that we often forget to wonder about life's most important questions. What the author of Hebrews says isn't exactly earth-shattering news to anyone. We will all die. It's part of the human experience. A day will come, hopefully later rather than sooner, when we will reach the end of our earthly lives. And we're told here, on that day, after we die, comes judgment. We will stand before God, the God who created us, and give an account for the lives we've lived. And again, if we're being honest, we don't slow down and think about this very often. Maybe we try and keep it from our minds. Maybe we've got so much going on around us, we don't have time to slow down and think about it. But if we're going to stand before God in God's courtroom at the end of this life, what will determine his verdict on our lives? What will he use to make that decision? 
The funny thing is, we're not often worried about standing before God in His courtroom, myself included. We're often much more concerned about the judgment or standing in the courtroom of family and friends and the culture and even our own judgment of ourselves. And in that courtroom, that worldly courtroom, What makes us innocent in the sight of those around us? What makes us feel like we are righteous in the eyes of those we live with every day? What assures us we're living a good life? The answers might change person to person, but I think for most people, when they think, am I righteous? Am I good? Am I living the life that I'm supposed to live? Am I being judged well by the people around me or by my own heart and mind? They're asking questions like, do I vote the right way? Do I put the right stuff on social media? Do I have the right view of the the kind of school that my kids should be in? Do I have the right kind of parenting strategy? Do I watch or listen to the right news station? Do I eat the right kinds of things? Did I have the right view of COVID or any number of social issues we debate constantly? Do I have the right view of the rich and the poor and success? Do I approach my job in the way that I would want others to approach it? Do I Not only do I go to church, but do I go to the right denomination? And this list could go on and on, but for many, again, ourselves included, these kinds of things, is, uh, these are how we often judge our lives and the lives of those around us. These, our answer to these questions give us assurance. This is how we decide who's good and bad, who's right and wrong, who's justified and unjustified. And these kinds of questions allow us to put our heads on the pillow at night confident we will be found innocent and that we are in the right compared to others and in the courtroom of this world. And yet when it comes to standing before God in his courtroom, these are not the issues that matter. These are not the things that justify us. When we stand before God, what will determine if we're righteous or unrighteous, innocent or guilty? What did we do with Jesus? That's the question. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What will make us righteous on that final day when we stand before God? Were we in Christ? Did we believe in him? Did we follow him? Because none of us can be righteous on our own. Left to ourselves, we would be found guilty in God's courtroom. But when we put our hope and trust in Jesus in the language of of, of Paul, we are in Christ. He covers us. And so when we stand before God, what God sees is Jesus' perfect righteousness in us, not our unrighteousness. And so the only sure and steady anchor we have in this life is Jesus. The only hope we have in death when we stand before God is Jesus. The only one who can cause us to look joyfully to the future and that judgment is Jesus. We'll go down to verse 28. This is the last verse we'll look at this morning. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What we find at the end of Hebrews 9 is that the once for all death of Jesus for sin is not only something we look back on as an anchor in the past that we hold on to, but it's also something that gives us incredible hope for the future. Because if we're being honest, it's really hard to be optimistic about the future right now. When we look at where the culture is going, or the economy, or politics, or artificial intelligence, or the news, or any number of things, there's plenty of reasons to be pessimistic about the future. And that pessimism can have lots of different effects on us. It can make us want to detach from society. It can cause us to think of life as something to endure rather than something to enjoy. 
And sure, maybe there's things you're looking forward to personally in the future, but it's just hard to be optimistic about where all of this is going when you take all of human life into account right now. But the beauty of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished is that he even allows us to look at an uncertain and often scary future full of hope and excitement and anticipation. Because just as Christ came to earth the first time, 2,000 years ago to pay our debt for sin, we're told here he will come again at any moment to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And I feel like as Christians, or maybe just for me personally, we need to get some of this eager expectation back into our lives. The band can come up, and we're going to sing here in just a second, but it's always funny to watch my kids on a day that my parents are coming up to visit us because as soon as they wake up, especially for the younger two, they begin to ask the question, when will Mama and Papa be here? Which I had some friends make fun of me that that was the name we call my parents, but that's crazy. So when will Mama and Papa be here? And as the time gets closer, a couple of them will just sit at the living room window and stare out the window. And every once in a while, our youngest, Zach, will run from the front door down to the road because there's a line of trees where you can't see what's coming, and he'll peek around the line of trees, and he'll run back up the hill just shaking his head, and then this will go on over and over again. And then finally, there's this moment where my dad's truck comes around the tree line and the two youngest just start screaming, they're here, they're here. And they run out the front door and they stop the truck before it can get all the way up into the driveway and they're, they're hugging my parents and part of the reason they're excited is because they want to see my parents. But then you see the other reason for their excitement as they jump into the back seat and begin bringing into the house bags of Little Debbies and candy, and two of them have a cooler on their shoulders full of pop, and it's just like this grocery store opens to them. And for the couple of days my parents are there, it's Lord of the Flies. And they can have whatever they want, whenever they want. I just kind of turn a blind eye to it. I don't want to, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I don't want to see it. And it's always funny to watch them react that way. And I think this text is encouraging us to have a little more of that kind of anticipation when we think about the future and we think about Jesus. Maybe we should spend a little more time at the window watching and waiting and hoping that Jesus will come soon. Maybe we should get back a little more of the hope of 1 Corinthians 2.9, as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. When's the last time that you let that hope flood your Heart, the last time you let that kind of hope into your soul. Because when you think about the future, if you start to put your focus on Christ and what He will do and not be fearful of what will happen, it will change your life. It'll change the way you think about the future, it'll change the way you approach death. And it will free you to experience some of the joy that Christ will give us in the future, in the present. I know there's times when it might seem like the Bible's truths are irrelevant or out of touch or out of date. And when you're facing pressing issues all around you, hearing more about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection can feel like this abstract thing that's so far away. But the reality is, wherever we are in this life, the most important thing we need to remember and to celebrate is that Christ has died once for all for sins, and He will come back to finish what He started. There's nothing else we could ever focus on as a church that will change our past, present, and future like that. I'm going to pray and we'll sing.